may be beginning to alienate some of the employees down at work. <laughs> what? Oh, that's great. The, the, the president has to worry about alienating the employees now. In fact, Job had started to alienate some of his colleagues. Worst that can happen is I can spill, spill some on my $3,000 suit. Welcome back to Growing Up Punk, the podcast about punk rock and all of its friends. My name is David. You're going to hear from Aaron shortly uh, as he's got his interview with Theo from Gob. That's why you're all here. Uh, but before we get to that, just wanted to share with you, uh, A, this is part one of a two-parter. So listen to this one and then come back and listen to part two when it's available. Uh, and also go follow us on all of our social media platforms. We're on Twitter and Instagram at Growing Punk Pod. You can also find us on Facebook as well. Um, and you can find our personal Twitter. Twitter and Instagrams linked on those as well. So at Growing Punk Pod. And wherever you're listening, make sure you rate, review, tell your friends. Thanks to all of you who've been sharing the show. Uh, share it around. If you know someone who's a fan of Gob, get them to give this a listen. Great interview. And so uh, with that, let's not waste any more time. It's, you're about to hear Aaron interviewing Theo from Gob. Yeah. So how, how's your day going today? What's uh, what's a typical day look like for you these days? Um. <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, what you mean, uh, if you're talking about getting up uh, and stuff, um, <laughs> or reg regiment, it's just sort of depends on the day, but I mean, usually, you know, uh, have a nice, uh, espresso Americano coffee going rocking and get me going a little bit and uh, nice. usually go for a, a walk, uh, for an hour walk. Uh, oh, right on. Sort of get the juices flowing and then try to do some exercise uh, uh, depending on the day, I guess, and all that. And then uh, um, watch a little bit of the news to check out some stuff online and then uh, uh, hopefully inspired to start writing and just working on some music and uh, if that, or if I'm not just doing the stuff for myself, which I'm trying to get my solo record done, and uh, I'm also recording other bands, okay, and stuff, and and working in the studio and stuff so with other stuff, I'm you know, juggling my stuff with other people's stuff, so right, keeping keeping busy with that. Yeah, so that like, is that what you're doing full time? Is you're you're working in working in your studio and still working with bands and stuff? Yeah, that's basically exactly what I'm. That sort of take, takes up all my time. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Yeah, that's. I mean, yeah, let's just jump right into that. So you, you mentioned you're working on working on your own stuff. What's uh, what's going on with that? What's kind of inspired you to? Well, I, I work on my stuff, but when I work on uh, my, I mean, like I also work on stuff for Gob too. It's both. It's like I work. I write songs, and um, you know, I I let uh, I'll let Gob here. The songs are like the camp if we're doing some stuff i usually um you know that's how we do we just you know let tom listen to the songs or the band gets to listen to them sort of like we kind of do like a democratic sort of sort of system of listening to the songs we wrote see which ones we like to want to work on mm -hmm. kind of thing and then uh you know and then of course being a songwriter you always have stuff either partly finished or that song did it just cut it at that point or whatever right uh, so and uh, and for me i just because i mean it's i mean i can write a song every day but i mean it, it, it's it's you know it's not always going to be the best song or anything right but it's, it's just well, what i like what i what sort of catches something to me or something i uh, i like or maybe i accidentally sing a lyric or a melody idea that I'm like, oh, I like what I'm kind yeah. of doing. <laughs> That's awesome. It's sort of random. It's like, it's, you know, it's sort of random. Sometimes it happens when I'm just driving in the car or something, you know, and I'm like, or whatever. Yeah. Um, but, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, the solo stuff I've been working on for a while, um, like a couple of years, it seems. I think it seems like I did the, dr the drums were recorded. Um, Lawrence uh, Butler uh a buddy of mine 
uh, he uh, he's a drummer. He's you know plays metal drums and stuff around in other bands and stuff in Vancouver. I've been friends with him. I got together with him when I was doing working on these songs. Had a bunch of all these ideas, and uh, we got jamming. And then uh, so I got him, got him up to speed. We went into the studio. And then I got him to drum the songs, lay the mail, and the, I mean all the all the drums, guitars, and the bass and stuff are pretty much all done. Okay. And that and and uh, like I did the one platinum blonde cover that was part of the same session. Um, I did about thirteen songs, uh, so definitely I, I released the platinum blonde. I stopped working on the other songs at the time just to finish the vocals and mix the other song to go on tour in November. Right. For the on the thugs, so those other twelve, I'm finishing off. That's so I'm trying to get those done for the springtime. Yeah, man. so yeah, kind of to, to clarify, so Theo and the Thugs, that's kind of um, you're touring with with some of the guys in Gob, and then a few others, and and playing Gob songs and some yeah. of kind of your original yeah. songs. Yeah, yeah, got Dan Dan uh, Garrison um, from the Core. Uh, that's C O R P S, like Army Corps. Okay. Like for like he plays guitar and sings um, as well. Like he does harmonies and stuff. But um, I think he's going to be singing. I'm going to try and get him to sing a track uh, on my solo record too. I just it's I just like I mean, I mean I like sharing the duties and he has like a higher range too. So okay. Uh, so it's kind of cool. I was like, you know, and and he he actually came out with us on on a gob tour just uh to do guitar you know guitar teching and he was a really good guitar player and he's an awesome dude so it was we hit it off and with like he was you know he had the same sense of humor and yeah he was, he <laughs> was so it was easy it was easy to get along with which is a big part of it too when you have that when you're touring or hanging out right you have someone that's fun to hang out with or oh, for sure you know and that's how it is like with gob it's like you kind of after years of being in the same band, it's like you're a family and you got to get along and you're doing stuff. So, yeah. So with, with Theo and the thugs, like with going on tour, is it just, you're getting too antsy while Tom's away or what's the thought of, you know, the inspiration to kind of keep going and. Yeah. Yeah. And that was basically, I mean, and Tom was busy a lot with some 41 and he was like, their album had come out again, like the new one. And they were on tour. busy on tour. So I kind of, I mean, some of these songs, like I said, they were already songs that um, I played or whatever for Tom back then. They were just, you know, there's, but it's like, it depends on what songs are better at the time. You know, it's even though there's still good songs, these ones I'm putting out, there was other songs that, that, you know, made the grade at that, at that time. Yeah. Or I've just improved or changed something a bit more to make the song uh, more to my liking or whatever. Yeah, and these and these songs. So these are songs that I, I've written from like, like nineteen, uh, like ninety six. Oh wow! Uh, to you know present day, like basically, they're all kind of like, there's a little form. So they do have a different kind of sound to them. Like you could tell some of them have like a new wavy kind of punk. Some are more punk. Some are more like hardcore. Some are kind of like that sort of rock and roll punk thing like you know like yeah. is there it, it, and it's just you know that's what's great it's, it's a solo record so um the thing is i'm just playing like all the guitars and the bass and and i'm rec- I recording the whole thing and mixing it myself so it's really one of those fucking annoying passion projects right <laughs> yeah just so when you eats away you're, until you're, you do it hey when you're doing everything everything takes so much longer right. like when you're doing everything like when you're recording it, you're oh, should I try it like this? I try it like this. It's different when it's easier when you have someone to feed it off of, like feedback from, like when I do it with Tom or whatever. We both have each other there in the room. Yeah, you know when he's when he's I'm recording him singing vocals or vice versa. We hear each, you know, we go oh hey try this or try that. Where I'm doing it myself, it's just a lot more and uh, uh, it just takes a lot more time too because you're like being more picky yeah and i don't know if that makes it better or worse and i think it's uh the latter because everyone seems to say because it's like you kind of have to give yourself a cutoff time and all that but now that i mean the songs are the way they are it's it's more the lyrics and stuff for me the melody everything's Mm. i'm trying to finish off all the lyrics 
So I always leave that uh, last. But that's, I mean, because I usually have the general idea of what I'm writing about. Um, but I, you know, whatever. I fucking turn, I turn out something like, I don't like that line. I'm like, <laughs> It always, it always like I've loved that uh, ever since I've written in Gob. It's just the when I get the lyrics. It's always been my little bit of, I would say, a little bit of my Achilles heel in a sense. I mean, I don't want to leave the lyrics to last, but I always, it's just, I think that's a common thing, right? With uh, musicians, I think. I mean, it seems like you kind of have the idea, and then you're going up to sing, and then you kind of change stuff. It's kind of different. I mean, I can write a story, and uh, and you know. And I guess I could sing it, but it's not going to be the same for the song. It doesn't feel like, to me, it's like, obviously the way it's, things are, I want to hear the way they're phrased and certain syllables, I guess. Yeah. And sometimes, sometimes, the, you know, they rhyme or this and that, it makes, it feels better or whatever. So it's, it's kind of like, it's kind of different too, right? Like, hmm. But I think that kind of kills the, sometimes they like, do it like that i don't know it, it's it's so it depends like i mean you could tell something you want to say be you know be creative a lot of you know descriptions then make the what, what you want to say and, and you can make a song out of it is, i guess but i just kind of i mean the way i read a song it's more like there's something that's got a hook and it it grabs me in and then uh, you know i have a riff working with it and then i create sort of a storyline to match that sort of feeling or, or if I'm in the mood of whatever the, the character or whatever is in that storyline, or if it's a real life situation. Kind of right. happening. Anyway, I, I'm sure I bored you. Uh, no, to death man, with this, this no seriously. Th this is the kind of, this is why I love doing this podcast because there are guys like you out there that, you know, I grew up listening to and I just love nerding out over the things that, you know, maybe 90% of music listeners don't really care about. They're happy just to, to listen online or on a CD or go to a show. But I love, I love knowing those little details. And I mean, I'm a, I'm a musician myself and I'm, you know, I've been playing music for 20 plus years. So I know what it's like, you know, when you talk about, you know, not being able to leave ideas alone, right? Like there's just something about having to get it out, even if it's just to get it out there, even yeah. if you know it's not going to be up to par, I'm not going to use it for anything, but if you don't do something with it, it just kind of eats away at you and it just kind of kills the creativity. You just, there's something about just having to get it out there. So yeah, yeah. I totally get that. It, it, and like I say, it's all the, the situations. So like, like the song I wrote, uh, no regrets, uh, for Gob on the, um, the world according to Gob. Yeah. Record. So good. So, uh, no regrets. I was actually in my car driving and I, had no there was no music on at the time and i and i had that melody like the the whole entire na, 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 yeah. na, like i had that so i started singing that and i thought is this is it something i know or like if I, you know heard this like i was like and when i got to my friend's place like this is on the way there and he had an acoustic guitar so i kept going oh fuck i don't have anything to record I wrote it <laughs> This was the year 2000 or 99 or whatever it was. Yeah. And I was like, oh, fuck, I think there's something. That, like, I, And I was like, I need that if I didn't do it. Because these ideas, they come into you. And sometimes they leave as fast if you don't keep record or keep track. Because the, I have, like, multiple other ideas. That right. Come, or I think I hear it, uh, what I thought I heard it, <laughs> the way it was. Uh, when I try and remember it, it's different if I did when I record it. I'm like, oh yeah, no, no, I did it like this. Yeah. So when you're having all these, so that's you know, and I got there and I was like, oh, figure out the key. Kind of did it really quick, and then so I kind of played the notes of the vocal line on the on the acoustic, and then I just kind of made sure the key was in that. What? Oh, okay, I go. Okay, I'll remember that now. And then, uh, yeah. So it's it's weird because I it's uh, some songs. It's you know, it's like they've taken when there were ten. 15 minutes to write right i mean i wish that was the you know the, that was all the time but obviously <laughs> yeah it, it never comes that easy all the time but sometimes it unfolds and it's like you get to a part where you're like oh fuck is stuck on this part for a month or two or six months or it's like oh i put it to the side a year later you come back oh it was a song. well then it, you see it differently again and yeah. then oh fuck and then there's the song but i mean it's all different for each person. So, I mean, Tom 
yeah, writes completely. I mean, in a somewhat similar fashion as any other music writer, but I, you know, you have all these ideas and you kind of, you know, make memos of them or kind of keep track and then um, figure out which ones you want to work on and build on them and stuff. So, but yeah, he's a fucking songwriting machine. That guy, he can, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, he can write songs and, uh, and uh, yeah, that's, that's, it, it's, yeah. So we, we worked well together, uh, you know, back and forth, criticizing and improving each other's stuff back and forth. It's pretty awesome. So do you, do you get to do that lots while, when he's, you know, busy on the road, do you guys still try stay connected well, and send in, ideas back in, and forth? And I'm in Vancouver. He's in New York, but I oh, okay. mean, technology you can send stuff obviously, but we talk on the phone all the time and, and, uh, but yeah, I mean, if we have something where, where something would think we're cool. I was out there at last January in New York, and we were working on uh, Gom songs. We're trying to get the the motor started again there. Um, so it was cool. It was really cool. We started working on uh, some new Gom stuff, uh, and uh, that, which is cool because I mean, some people think for some reason that we're not a band anymore. Or yeah, and I was going to ask about that. I, yeah, yeah, we're definitely is um, no it, Gaba hasn't stopped. I mean, I guess it hasn't been a hiatus because we can't really do. Uh, you know, it's not really Gob unless it's all the members, right? Especially yeah. if it's Tom's out there too. Yeah, um, that's a, a big part of it. And actually, I got to see him play with uh, with some forty one maybe just a month ago or so. Um, who? Uh, I'm, I, I'm just kidding. Okay. <laughs> It's like, oh, did I not say it? Yeah, and it was, I mean. Oh, he, didn't, he never told me he was playing with them? No, I was kidding. What a jerk. He just said he was busy when I've been trying to connect with him. Yeah. <laughs> no, he's been playing and filling in for them, like, like started off in 2006. Right. When Brown Sound left the band. Yeah. And we were working on our Muertos uh, Vivos record at the time. Yeah. Yeah, so that kind of just sort of happened at the same time as we we're just finishing it. We're like kind of getting that one wrapped up. Yeah, it's always always interesting seeing. I mean, I only ever saw Gob live once in Regina, and that was, I mean, a number of years ago that you guys were here last. Um, but I mean, I've been listening to your band since you know the mid mid nineties, and so it was it was interesting seeing Tom play with a different band. I mean, I'd only seen him, like I said, with Gob once, but but it was cool. It was a it was an awesome show, and I mean, they killed it. I actually enjoyed them and thought they they stole the show over the offspring. Like they just sounded amazing and pumped up the crowd. And so I'm sure that's kind of cool for you to see your friend up there doing that. And... Yeah. Yeah, totally. And yeah. And especially like when you have a full lighting show, like a whole awesome like crew working with you and making the show good too. Like the, having the band rock out and having that whole entire, the show lighting, everything together. I mean, it's just a full package. So it's, it's amazing. Yeah. It's, it's way, it's definitely like full on concert. Like it's rad. Yeah. What is that like, like from your standpoint? And I, I, I hope that's not like a weird question, but just like to see, you know, your friend up there, do you feel like envious at all? Like, man, like that'd be so awesome getting to play, in all these big shows and these big tours. And th is that something? Well, that we, kind did of... play, we, we did play, I mean, gone played, we, we did lots of touring. Right. It wasn't like, and we did a lot of big shows. I mean, in fact, uh, we did three months touring in the U.S. or North America, uh, Japan, and Australia uh, uh, in 2002 for the Foot and Mouth, right? Uh, foot and Mouth Disease record, and that was the biggest tour, like consecutive, like straight, because it was uh, 15,000 people at pretty much every show. That was it. Wasn't art? We were on. Um, we were uh, opening up. And stuff. So I mean, but we were all, like playing in front of like fifteen thousand people like every night for three months. So, like obviously there was days off, but yeah, yeah. Who yeah, was that I tour mean, with? The, um, that was with Avril Lavigne. Okay, she, she yeah, asked us that. to come on that tour. Um, I mean, it was kind of like oh well, she's like sort of like a top forty, um, you know, like thing going on. Right. Our man, our management was working. Obviously, was. Uh, well, it's not obvious, but she was working with the same management company and they, she was, you know, she kind of like, she was, you know, had that song Skater Boy. She was kind of like, sort of like a punk rock, sort of rock and roll girl that right. was sort of, 
you know, I guess that's the branding or image that they had of her. And that's what sort of she went. But she did like our band. She did like she knew the songs and stuff. And she asked us to open up. And it was kind of like, you know, obviously managers like this is the smartest thing for you guys to do. Yeah. You know. And you know what? It was an experience. It was really cool for us. I mean, how many bands can say, oh, we played Budokan, a sold out show at Budokan in Japan. Right. I mean, wow. not not many bands can say that. I mean, obviously Kiss and the Beatles and Nirvana can say that. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, that's amazing. Yeah. No, so, so I mean, like, so Gob has played, like, we played, like, you know, whatever it was, Barry Park. Uh, I think there's 50 or 60,000 people with Tool. Like, uh, it, it was, there was one 80,000 uh, venue that we did outdoors, Quebec, uh, I think it was 400 and something year uh-huh. anniversary. It was like a Celine Dion, Paul McCartney, no effects. Like, it was a huge, like, one night, one day was punk rock bands. And there was like 80, it was fucking huge. Yeah. So we played those huge things. So we see that. So, yeah, when I see Tom, uh, up there playing for the shows it's 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 cool to see him playing it's different though because in gob it's got he's more of a front man you know and right. he's got more yeah. charisma and he's because he's singing it's his song it's different or our song yeah. it's different right so he's kind of like in, in that he's he's sort of like playing guitar and helping out and you know i guess he's a member of the band actually so so he's playing with them and uh you know, it's like it's a different different level. I mean, uh, some pretty ones gotten a lot of status uh, in the U.S. You know, their record, their older records went like I think well, I believe platinum and stuff. And, yeah, yeah. So I mean, they got they got on and caught the train back then, and they just started you know took them for that ride. So it all depends. It's like every band. It's like it's not just always about just the. The, the bands or the music or it's right. it's luck, luck of the draw sometimes you just oh for you sure just get in that right thing the right song catches at the right time and and all that and uh so it's it's, it's all that kind of all those factors happen yeah you know, yeah sorry to, to clarify i wasn't i wasn't stating that that gob hadn't played big shows i just meant you know with you not being on tour as much anymore just if you ever when you saw him playing, if you kind of felt like, man, like I want to be up there playing. Well, yeah. I mean, I guess it depends like on the show. I I mean, but I mean, if I haven't played in a long time on stage live that I'd be like, but most of the time I'm just watching the show and and get in, you know, watching and enjoying the show. uh, You know, just like a regular person when, when you see a show. Um, but yeah, I mean, if I hadn't played on stage for a year or two years, I'd be like, oh, fuck, I want to get out there and play. And that's basically what kind of happened with the thugs. It was just kind of like kind of a little bit restless on the sidelines and just waiting to see if we're going to do anything. Yeah. How and those... I just said, so, you know, just that's got to take the manners into your own hands sometimes. And and, all. and, like, and Tom's been obviously crazily super supportive over the thugs. It's not, yeah. you know, it's not like he didn't know it was like, you know, I talked to him about it and told him we're going to go on tour. And, and, you know, we played gob songs, ones that, that I sing, sing and stuff for the shows for the thugs. Uh, you know, and, and gob hasn't played really a tour, like a tour across Canada since 2015. So it's, um, I'm hoping. And I think, you know, cause talking to Tom, we're just uh, talking about uh, uh, releasing Too Late No Friends, uh, the 25th anniversary. Oh, right on. And because it's never been on vinyl. So we were talking about that just recently and obviously uh, wanting to do a tour for that, for that record. Yeah. Oh, man, like, that'd be amazing. The entire record. So that's something uh, to be, you know, uh, look forward to and uh, so that's cool and obviously it'd be cool if we can get another single out or something to promote that you know just uh, or if we have another song uh, yeah. and something new come out like it all depends on our schedules and all that you know yeah for sure man that'd be amazing make sure you come uh this this far out uh out east if you're gonna do that i'd love to see you guys again yeah you mean like in saskatchewan yeah yeah, we always go by, we go through there. It's sort of in the way between Alberta and Winnipeg. It's like, what's this province in the way all the time? Uh, <laughs> well, the, I mean, no, I, we always play, I, we always play uh, Saskatoon and Regina. 
and we have played shows in like Moose Jaw, uh, okay. Swift Current, there's somewhere other, oh, I wow. think it was Ed- Edison, and, the, or, uh, and then there was another place, like we played back in the day, we played somewhere north, I remember. In, in Fort McMurray or something? Or? Oh yeah, we played uh, in Fort okay. McMurray, yeah. but we also played uh, another smaller place, like back in the day, we're talking like in the 90s, oh, Okay. when we were doing Too Late No Friends in 96, like we played like all all over wherever they would let us play oh yeah wherever we could go they said can we come in and annoy you in this town they'd be like yeah like hey we're coming to annoy you yeah but we 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 played we played all over the fucking canada like (laughs) we did multiple tours back and forth you know and it wasn't until obviously soda came out in the much music stuff and uh you know where that kind of turned it up and to a different degree it wasn't even obviously you don't you're not ready for it just you don't expect it it just they just started playing it and and then you know people are, more people are coming to the shows right yeah, yeah that would have been i mean I'm, that would have been the first exposure that i had to you guys was seeing seeing that video on much music i did I, I didn't have cable but i went to a friend's at lunch uh at school in high school and <laughs> remember seeing that video and then um I think it was probably not too long after that, um, How Far Shallow Takes You um, came out. And that album, like, yeah, I would love to hear kind of what happened in between Too Late No Friends and How Far Shallow Takes You. I just, I love when a band, uh, you know, when you put a record on, you're like, okay, I've listened to their last stuff and I liked it, you know, it was kind of sounded okay. And then you put the, a new record on and it just kind of blows you away. Like just the production was so much better and the songwriting and, um, so I'm not I'm not insulting your past work, but I just I love that when a band kind of catches you off guard, and just kind of pushes themselves, you know, into a whole new realm. So what we'll, we'll, we'll kind of went into that album and what happened in between there to um, to kind of make that happen? Okay, okay, that's a loaded question. Yeah, um, yeah. A, so whatever you want to say about that time <laughs> and kind of kind of what went well, into that. Uh. Or what do you remember kind of of, you know, your videos getting more more play on much music and then when How Far Shallow Takes You came out? And... Oh, okay, so, I mean, I'll, uh, I'll take you back. I'll take you back. Yeah, let's um, do this. So, okay, so we did, obviously, Too Late No Friends uh, in 95. Um, we released it on Mint Records, um, an, an indie label in Vancouver. Um, and so, yeah, we did that whole record. We did 20 songs. We recorded it mixed it and mastered everything was done i mean we didn't we just we just played we had uh, other people that we that recorded it for us and did all the mixing and stuff but i mean we played part of obviously producing our own stuff uh, from the beginning you know but that was our our second kind of release because our first release i guess would be an ep that we did in in 94 which we did on our own and made our own cds you know before like it was like we had to actually go to a cd manufacturing plant that made them and you know, I remember our friends were like, oh, my God, you guys have CDs out? <laughs> was that the you know, uh, scene on now, TV? Now you can just burn, if you have a CD-ROM or a burner or whatever, you could burn off a computer. But back then, it was like they didn't have that. And if you did have one, I think they cost oh, like, yeah, they were expensive. You know, eight or ten grand at the, you know, at whatever. It was, you know, it's just crazy. It's just like when the first plasma TV came out or, right, yeah, yeah. or, or first OLED TV came out. They're all like this crazy. They just because of the newest technology and they've only made a certain amount and it costs crazy. Anyway, so we, Too Late No Friends comes out and um, the label wanted to do a video for You're Too Cool uh, for the first single, but Tom and I wanted to, we wanted to do a single uh, for Soda because we wanted to build a BMX uh, ramp. And yeah, jump, I love that. And, and, and do you know, lake jumping because we wanted to do that. And so my cousin who, uh, had a couple of a couple, bunch of film cameras and stuff, and he was just you know in the film arts, and he liked making indie movie kind of things. He was just sort of starting off, uh, and we kind of said, "Hey, would you want to do a video of us? We want to build this ramp." So, this, uh, so he kind of storyboarded this whole kind of thing out because we told him we wanted to do lake jumping based around it, and it was a sixteen mil you know film video and. And he did it, and it was fucking. We had fun doing it because it was, it was just hard to get everybody to come out in the band, uh, to, because everyone was either working at like Tom was working at a record store, you know, we're all kind of doing a thing like doing our 
side you know our, our job thingies whatever yeah. and and doing the band thing on the side or just trying to make you know make it to practices and like go to shows and all that kind of stuff and uh and um yeah so with all that and uh you know uh fuck where was i here someone just threw a jacket at me so <laughs> i got kind of sidetracked came out of nowhere my brother threw it at me um Anyway, um, yeah. So uh, with that, we basically um, we we you know we put out this record, um, and uh, oh, sorry, video. Go fuck. Welcome back to Planet Earth. <laughs> um, we put out this video, and uh, it t- it sort of came out and took took the much music on. Which, I mean, at the time, much music was basically Canada's number one ish like rock station or radio rap hip hop like it was a mix of everything but it was like everyone watched it because it had everything and it was like um if you had, obviously you're like you said you didn't have cable but well people that knew it or talked with everyone kind of watched it because it was like music and video so it was like that art form the, those two art forms the music and the video part sort of tell you know give the a better story of the band usually the character or what they kind of and we that was our first video and it took off like it was it was surprising. I mean, like we just wanted to do that. We weren't looking to be like, I'll oh, become the next whatever band or whatever. We were just having fun doing our own thing. Yeah. So, and in the sense it became viral, the station kept playing it. People were requesting it. They kept talking about it. Um, and it was only like, you know, it was kind of short. The song was like just over a minute and a half. And uh, so they were always kind of squeezing it here and there and, you know, and then they would talk about the bugs coming out of my mouth or whatever at the end or, you know, and stuff. <laughs> and I'm like, well, that's kind of funny because that part almost didn't even like that wouldn't have been there if everyone showed up. Uh-huh. Everyone was supposed to show up and we were supposed to like submerge like synchronized swimmers in the storyboard. Uh, my cousin made was we we're supposed to uh, submerge underwater while we're singing the end of soda and just kind of like go down with our heads looking up and just kind of slowly submerging under the water and bubbling up that was the end of the video so there was no the only one who showed up that day to do the end of the video was me because everyone else was busy or they just excuses right because no one when you do a band it's like you know i mean it's, I'm, i don't know if you know it's like sometimes it's hard to get like oh the drummer can't make it to jam or oh, yeah. Or, yeah. or you know the, something happened at work or they you know you know it's like a bad day for this person you know, it's like the band doesn't show or whatever everyone was busy whatever excuse it was you know they had to come out you know it was further out it wasn't like close by yeah uh, so and my cousin said what can we do and then i said well i don't know i had a picture i had a photograph of this um leather jacket or crane fly whatever you want to call it it was like those bigger mosquitoes okay with, with wings i don't know what you guys call them out in regina Usually come out in August or something like in the summertime. Okay. You know what I'm talking? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I'm, I can't. Uh, they look like uh, bigger, kind of like they call some people call them mosquito eaters. I don't know. They look like kind of like dan- daddy uh, spider, like the daddy, daddy long legs. Arms. Yeah, maybe like, like at yeah. the lake and stuff. They're they're around more. I can definitely picture them. I can't think of the name, but yeah. Yeah. So at the time when we're doing the video. There was a bunch of these, and I had a picture of one of them that had my tongue out, and I did this photograph, um, and I was just trying to get these pictures, uh, and my cousin said, could you do, like, a whole bunch of those in your mouth? So I spent hours collecting these oh, gross. fucking bugs in a giant, <laughs> like, jar. Like, it's about a couple hours, and then, so, yeah, so I, I literally was 27 or 28. Like, I remember counting, it was, like, around there, and then I'm like... That seemed like the like looking at the jar with all the, them inside there, like all like trying to fight to get out or like you know. And I was just thinking, oh, I don't know. I'm second guessing. There's like there's a lot of fucking bugs. Uh, these anyway. So he goes. I just said, okay, just time me to do it because I'm just gonna put them out of my mouth and then do the scene. I just you know want to get them out and and then run to the bathroom and gargle Listerine or whatever. Like, you know, just like, I, <laughs> or, you know, <laughs> or some of Jameson whiskey or something to, <laughs> to kill just in case. I, I mean, yeah, they yeah. weren't, they weren't the filthy uh, insects. They didn't like, you know, they weren't like flies where they went on to feces and all that kind of shit there. They usually were on the side of the house or in tall grass. Or, right. Yeah. But anyway, it still was kind of gross. Cause when I put all 27, 28 of these in my mouth, 
all I kept, you know, I could just feel them um, fucking moving around, <laughs> trying trying to get out. And oh. <laughs> I don't know if you don't you don't really understand at the time. Like, did I do like? Oh my god, I can't believe I, yeah, you because know, I was kind of you know I was young. I'm like, oh, I was just I just want to do this for the thing to get it done. You know, one is different than having a whole bunch. Like yeah. That. So I did it, and I pretended that I, it didn't bother me or whatever it was. You know, and of course they came out, and all, all of them, some of them were stuck to each other with saliva, and it was it was pretty crazy because there's some of them were trying to fly away and they were stuck. In, in if you see the actual footage, it's pretty. Uh, and my cousin filming is actually laughing and going, "Oh my god, that's disgusting!" And the camera's <laughs> kind of shaking a bit because he's grossed out. And I'm just sitting there doing it like I know I have to have my mouth opening on the last note of the song. So uh, it worked out anyway. Uh, uh, this turned into a long story. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. So we had man. this song. We had this set up. This song, and people were, uh, you know, coming out to the shows. Now uh, we were doing really like well, like for a show attending. Like people are fucking showing up and wanted to see us play. So obviously, uh, we did ask it on TV in between uh, "Too Late, No Friends" and oh, okay. "How Far." And that was another EP we actually did with a band. We did a a band that. Uh, Tom had a record label that he was doing on the side with Positive Records uh, thing, and he was like, he was like, his girlfriend at the time was in the band, so he wanted to uh, say, should we do like a cross split with uh, another Joe and Gob, and oh, you yeah. know, just about they would that come band. on, they'd, yeah, they come out on tour, and sort of like help out the label, help everything out, and just sort of. Anyway, so we kind of did an EP to just see how one day we did nine songs, they did nine songs, followed by a bunch of. Uh, hilarious uh, prank phone calls at the time before you know it was even like that big of a deal right yeah and uh, yeah so my our friend uh, which we he called himself George Zorn which was pretty funny I was there with a lot of the times when he was doing these phone calls some of them he recorded on his own and it was just like you know it was funny like we thought it was funny and we put these on on that so our songs were kind of it. There was a little difference from that from uh, "Too Late No Friends," but you know, it sounded the same. We used the same guy to record it uh, and all that stuff as we did "Too Late No Friends," so it was very similar. Um, the songs obviously were a little different. They were a little bit more political. They had the lyrics were okay. a lot different and stuff. It seemed from that, but there was a little growth in that. But when we were working on in '98 on "How Far." Um, our old drummer, which was at the time was still in the band, our first drummer, um, you know, he had a, a wife or uh, they were going to have a kid. And um, the drumming on that record was way harder for him than what we were wanting him to do. These songs now evolved to the songs that you've heard. And uh, it was just, we were like, uh, you know, we were rehearsing with them, but it was hard for him to keep up. And, um, you know, because he was used to kind of doing um, the style that we're doing, but we were growing as song, you know, songwriters and music. Yeah. We're, you know, we just didn't want to do the same thing as the last thing we were just doing. Right? Right. We're like, you know, it just, we were, that's the way we saw it. But I know a lot of bands or people want to hear the cohesiveness from one record to the other. Like it's similar enough so that they can, they can uh, still, you know, whatever, get into it or whatever it is. Yeah. But it was something, it wasn't like, um, we didn't like it. Those are the songs that came out. Every uh, thing the way affected us, our lives, relationships, stuff. We were just going and growing as human beings and just dealing with stuff. And, you know, now we've, you know, been in a band for four years and we toured all over the U S uh, you know, we did a lot of U S touring um, it, like for, you know, months at a time, you know, like with, a five dollar each person gets five dollars a day like yeah. enough to put gas in to kind of do, you know go to albertson's or ralph whatever it was in the states get a burrito apple and some water you know it was like you know i looked so trim <laughs> i mean tom looked like a piece of chicken to me sometimes <laughs> but i mean no yeah. <laughs> i'm vegetarian oh, okay. so he, looked more, he looked more like a, a, a vegan uh, or a vegetarian chicken strip there we go um, and uh but uh, yeah i have been actually <laughs> vegetarian uh for over 20 years now it's been 20 oh, wow. i don't know whatever i can't even, I, I lost count but um 
but yeah, anyway, so, you know, we did the tour and we did that tour for the record. We put how far shall it take show. We did this hard and soul bullet on the fucking, we went on tour in the States, Canada, and we did probably a couple of years t- touring for it. And, uh, you know, people thought, Oh, it's cool. You know, they kind of, but it wasn't the same. You know, they wanted to hear too late. No friends. They were, it didn't seem like they were that crazy about these new songs. Hmm. And it was like, Oh really? It's like, cause you know, we love them obviously. Uh, but it was, you know, like you're just playing. But it wasn't until we started playing World According to God when that record came out on that tour. We started playing. They Then everyone wanted to hear How Far Shall It Takes You. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's weird how that happens. Though. I think it's kind of like, you know, when you, like, the whole thing is it's so different. It's almost like, and we did, we had a different drummer. Like I said, Gabe, that was Gabe came into the, to the fold at that point into the gob camp and that was like he was our second drummer that we ever had like because pat wolfman um sort of bowed out and he couldn't do it and he was you know has tried you know had a baby there he was raised so that was kind of like you know he was more into like doing the weekend shows bar gigs and, and you know this whole new thing us touring and getting popular was you know we, it was a little too much for him it wasn't it was kind of surprising you know for him and um but anyway, and it wasn't as Gabe was just, he'd been playing in all these hardcore bands and always played, he's a great drummer and he can also sing. So it was awesome to add this, like all of a sudden this more precise drummer and like, and he could do backing vocals. It definitely added another depth and element to um, the whole sound. Yeah. But it brought it out. Like So these songs were kind of like Gabe, maybe we rehearsed them with Gabe for probably three weeks. Uh, you know, they went into the studio and probably did that whole album in like 10 or 12 days, like recorded and mixed wow. it. And uh, the thing is, um, it's it's not that this is got to remember, this is analog days. Like there's no pro tools. Right. It's like yeah, yeah. what you hear on there is what we're playing. It's not being like it's not like how bands do it these days where it's, you know, if the band kind of the player kind of sucks or is drumming <laughs> horrible, that you can just edit everything and all that. Right. I mean, there is ways to, you know, there is ways you can edit, obviously, on analog tape, but you got to have a guy that knows what he's doing or whatever. Yeah. To yeah. Make, or whatever. But again, like Gabe was like one or two takes, uh, you know, at most for the drums. And we go, okay, well, that's the best take for sure you know you know and then we would just put our guitars it's like we we, you know you had to go in and play your parts and you had to be prepared um and as any band should be going to the studio and uh so it was cool because we had a we had a month or something with pat going over the songs and we had another three weeks so the pre-pro for us was getting kind of like monotonous it was kind of like oh god i can't wait to actually get these songs and but yeah it just prepared us uh, you know, to to get our parts done quicker and and you know nailing the shit. Yeah. So what what kind of change did that did that album bring on the band? Because that I mean, well, that so we was... brought Blair Blair Calababa, which right. recorded a bunch of punk rock and hardcore bands at the time too. So him, um, we that. did when we did Too Late No Friends. It was even though it was done to a digital format, it was still like a live, like it was recorded, like it, but the digital format was. Uh, Elisa's ADAT tapes were the tapes were still recording like it was analog except for it's a different depth of resolution of sound you know like it's 24 or 16 I think it's 16 bit 44 one I mean this is for all the tech nerds like it's basically I think they I don't even think I, I don't even know if the Elisa's ADAT did 24 bit 48k uh, I mean, maybe some of the newer ones, but the time when we did ours, I think it was just 16 bit, 44.1 kilohertz, which is the same quality as a CD. But when we were recording Too Late No Friends, it was just put out just as if it was recorded to regular analog tape. Um, there was no digital manipulation or whatever, like editing in the in the sense, because we were doing it fast. We were like punk band and that's what we did, right? So, um, and the same with when we did How Far, we just had a guy that was better in the studio who recorded uh, and we wanted to make sure we got good sound. So we went into a good studio with good gear, a good, you know, like we were kind of, you know, I was really inquisitive, like going, well, why does that sound better than that? Why does this preamp, you know, like, Oh, it's cause it's Neve. This is an SSL board or, you know, it's like, Oh, this is like this analog tape, two inch tape here. We got like 
so I mean, I learned a lot too, picking up things, which I became, you know, useful to be later on, which I started recording, um, you know, with the Mortals, uh, Vivos record, yeah. uh, part 13, like that record I recorded and mixed the whole thing. Like, uh, I mean, I don't even have a song on the apartment 13, actually. It's all Tom, like singing on that but right. i did uh, but i mean that was kind of like i mean again when you're working on your own stuff it always takes way longer there's way you know you can do more options when you're doing it yourself yeah yeah with the the world according to god it seemed like that album really kind of pushed you guys more into the mainstream i mean i remember the i hear you calling was on much music all the time and just more people i knew started listening to your band and what what was the kind of the change going on there and did you did you notice a significant shift in people coming to shows and um i mean that because that album sold fifty thousand plus right so that uh, yeah the the world according to gob uh yeah it sold over yeah that was it's a gold record at the time you had to sell that many for gold we did we received a gold record um which is amazing for you know a punk band at that time in in canada yeah and we we did too late no friends which it did it sold quite a few on uh mint records itself but then there was a whole weird thing happened with the company distribution thing cargo records where they kind of you know, the money that they took the money and they didn't, they ran out or bang went bankrupt and they didn't even pay labels for the records that they sold. And they owed mint records a lot of money, which, you know, they had to pay us for the royalties. They, Cause you know, it wasn't that much to pay back that record. Cause I mean, I, we recorded, I think our advance at the time for that one in 1995 was like $1,600, whatever for oh, the wow. record. Yeah. Which is, you know, uh, which they got back. And then we had a really, because it was an independent thing, we had a really great royalty rate. Like, it's really fair. But they couldn't afford to pay us because of the cargo records went, uh, didn't pay the distributor because they went out, uh, went, like I said, bankrupt. So the label decided, you know, option uh, uh, was to give us back our record that we had, would own it. And then we had to go to a different label or do whatever we wanted. Or, you know, or we'd have to either, I guess, wait or until more money came in or whatever but uh we obviously took that one because it's always better to own your own masters right and we knew that record was doing well and it was a um it you know in canada it seemed like it was doing decent so we thought we'd obviously keep it yeah do you remember uh, how much um how far shallow sold <laughs> uh or just kind of what the contrast was you know yeah, between, i think from that i think record? that I mean, like I, I, I don't like I don't have the unit numbers, but I did inquire, we did me and Tom inquired about this a little while ago, um, and you know just because we were trying to figure because we we knew that uh, I know that foot mouth disease is close to being a gold record. Um, I don't know if it's just a few thousand short or something like that. Apparently, okay. uh, which that one is, and I think. Um, I think how far and too late are like in the like they're a little further away than uh, foot and mouth disease, but they're not too far off. But I mean, obviously, it would take another record and like something to kind of bring it back up. But right. yeah, I mean, a lot of them, a lot of those other ones came kind of are close too. The thing is with Too Late No Friends, it was before Sound Scan and all that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, that's right. And sort of the number, it was all different because when we did license it out to to network. <laughs> Um, I know that they sold, I think, twenty or thirty thousand of them themselves. But that oh, was wow. a, that was in nineteen ninety nine. Uh, so, I mean, the record was already out in ninety five. They sold a whole bunch then, and we and that was our prime when it came out. So we don't, I don't really know the exact uh, numbers. What they like, you know, there is obviously we could look into it um, and ask for whatever. But I mean, we it, it, we just kind of like you know, whatever. I mean, what, what are you going to do? Like, yeah, eventually foot and mouth will probably be the next one that we'll get a record for like a gold record, but I don't know if anyone cares. Right. <laughs> I mean, I do. Yeah. Me, well, I mean, yeah. yeah it's, a, it's an achievement. And nowadays I think it's only 30 or 30, like 30 or 35,000 maybe for a gold record in Canada, as oh, opposed okay. to 50,000. Mm -hmm. Like the number definitely 
it's different because not hardly anyone buys music and they do it differently now. If, right. If you stream or you buy a song, say you buy the album has 10 songs or they buy one song, it could be the same song 10 times. Uh, that's considered one album sale, right? Cause there's right. 10 songs or whatever on the record. Like there's ways they do it now because they were trying to make it make sense. Yeah. And the certain amount of streams would equal um, one record album sale you know, they had a system that they had to figure out, right? So, yeah, no, it's yeah. There's so many differences, and I'm sure, obviously, you you've seen them from, you know, they're playing music for 20, 25 years, and I'm, I know it's really interesting as as a musician, just kind oh, of. Oh, it's forty thousand. Through... Okay, it's for it's forty thousand. Um, uh, after 2016, they changed it to forty thousand uh, records to be a gold record as opposed to fifty thousand. Oh, okay. So we sold them the old school hard way. Yeah. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> well, it's still hard, I guess, obviously, to do 40000 I mean, that's amazing if you can do that in Canada. Like, that's a gold record. It's a gold record. Right. You know, it, to, I mean, bringing that home and giving that to, like, my parents is like, wow, you know. Sure it was amazing. Yeah, because, you know, my parents were Greek immigrant parents. They worked really hard, and, you know, they did this, and they're like, you know, they wanted me to be a doctor or a lawyer or uh, oh, next a, best thing. Or, or, you know, or whatever, <laughs> pilot or what, you know, like something like, like, you know, just like any other, like, immigrant parents, they want their kids to have that kind of status or, like, right. my son is this. And he's like, and, you know, I want to play, you know, I want to rock. And it's like, no, 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 you, you know, you know. <laughs> No, 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 no. But when I, you know, I brought the gold record and gave them that at that time, that was kind of like awesome, right? Because it's presented to them and it's from, and it was like a cool thing. Like it's like bringing home an Olympic gold, I guess. Like, yeah. You know and did they you have know? like but, any content? But the world, but the, I mean, but instead of having, I guess, the whole country <laughs> wrap around, it's just your whole family and the band members <laughs> right. or being involved, I guess, in a sense. And did they have any like context of what a gold record was or what a punk band was, or was it just kind of? Oh, no, they just, they, you know, it's all loud to them. Yeah. It doesn't matter what it is. It's all loud. And, but, you know, then it, then, you know, my mom would be like, well, Michael Jackson has gold record. How come you don't have your own house and an amusement park, <laughs> in, the, amusement park in the back? You know, it's just because it's having the great parents are like, well, he has, but I make, no, he has platinum diamond. He's like, he has gold. Records in every friggin' country there yeah. is on this planet. As if the different we got it in Canada, it's different, you know. Right. But it's you know, trying to separate that and and even at the time too, with other people knowing we got a gold record or just the status of our band being sort of like you know, all I mean basically in in the late or early two thousands were kind of like a household name in the sense where um the you know, the kids and the teenagers and uh and the moms and dads, like they need, you know, they might have liked all of them, like like the band at the at the same time, or didn't mind or certain songs right. or whatever. Um, and and it was a it was a crazy time. It was cool. Uh, it's just it's lucky we were lucky to have that uh, that time and go through it because it was very interesting. And you know, my brothers hated going out with me or a girlfriend would hate going somewhere with me. And if we got recognized, it was like, you know, back then when you used to go to the mall and go shopping because people would talk to you and like stop. And then uh, me being me, I always would talk to pretty much everyone and just, you know, being myself. Yeah. And uh, cause they, you know, they want to talk and hang out where, you know, everyone's like annoyed. Let's go. Like you spend the <laughs> time with the fan, <laughs> you know, whatever. So I, I, <laughs> I mean, it was always, I was always felt like, like, this is like, I don't know when I'll ever have this again. You know, like every time exactly, you know, yeah. else, it's, it's kind of like, it's, you know, it's an awesome feeling to go out and to have people show up at shows and sing your songs, yeah. you know, and be in the, in the same kind of, you know, unit, uh, you know, um, and, and have that love, right? Like that love from the audience or whatever, the fans and yeah, no, that's. I'm that's, hopefully we can, you know, keep it alive still. It'd be cool to get another, squeeze another record, record out, and yeah. make it good as usual. We try to put out music that we we want to put it out, not for the sake of just putting out. I mean, we have a bunch of songs or B sides or songs we've done we never released and stuff, but it's kind of like we only put out the stuff that we want to put out or like, 
I'm not trying to put out a great hits records or right. whatever. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. But I mean, um, I mean, I don't know if that's something the labels. I guess if the label owned all your music, yeah, uh, they could then, do they, that, but... then they they can do it. So lucky for us, we're pretty scattered all over the board. Yeah. Well, man, I I gotta wrap this up because my kids are gonna be home soon. But I've got so many more questions for you. So uh, will will you come back on the show again sometime? <laughs> For sure, man. Like, th- th- I, I love this so much. I love just hearing all these backstories and all these things that, and that's why I love doing this because, you know, I'm sure you guys did lots of interviews and, and stuff over the years, but lots of those, you know, are just kind of, you know, asking about the new record or, or whatever. But I love hearing all, like, you know, that story about yeah. the bugs in your mouth for the video. Like, how many, <laughs> how many other people know that besides, you know, you guys that well, were there? Whatever, and your friends if anyone and... inquired, I mean, I would tell them, but yeah, I mean, I have talked about it before me in, you know, back in the day a little bit, they talked, but it wasn't like, yeah, I went in through like way more detail, you know, with you obviously about it. Um, but again, um, this whole thing, uh, uh, you know, the whole thing, this, you know, this thing that I'm doing, like, I guess, like I, like I said, and what Gob and we get to do is it's fucking awesome. It's like, we're lucky to be part of this and, and keep it going. Um, and again, I'm in the middle of, like I said, of just trying to get this, uh, the steel and the thug solo record finished and, uh, and do some touring, hopefully, um, uh, you know, anytime after, I don't know, from April, May to the fall yeah. of something, you know, uh, I'll have the record out hopefully by the, uh, spring, later spring or whatever it's going to be. Yeah. Um, but yeah, anyway, so yeah, well, I'm excited to hear that. I, I mean, I, I love your songwriting and I've been, you know, following Thank you for you. many years. So I'm, I'm excited to hear what, what comes next, but yeah, well, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to talk today and just to be open and honest and sharing stories and being goofy. That's, that's, uh, that's why I love you and why I love gobs. So, Thanks, and, and many others. So yeah, let's, uh, let's try connect, uh, maybe in the next few weeks or in the month here and, and uh, keep going because there's, I mean, we we only touched really on you know two or three of your albums, and there's there's others I wanna <laughs> like I wanna I get into, to... and so <laughs> yeah, I, t- I thought I talked to you here enough, but I guess no you way. want more. You want more punishment, dude. Keep it coming. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks so much for your time today, Theo. Really appreciate that. No problem, Aaron. All right, talk to you later. Okay, see you next. Bye. The guy in the the $4,000 suit is holding the elevator, but the guy doesn't make that in three months. Come on!